This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. The Python Hyena. And, you know, I've had a, an awful lot of luck with getting some interviews here for the, sh uh, for the station and for the, my show, and, and uh, Mike Gormley has been very, very good with me, and... Uh, I think uh, tonight's guest, I think, is my sixth interview through him, and uh, uh, what a blessing that has been. And uh, I shouldn't say this, but I think Mike's birthday is tomorrow, a little birdie. What? Yeah, I think I found that out accidentally on Facebook, and I don't even have him on my friends list. So, <laughs> But I'm going to say this, though. My guest tonight has some interesting stories, and Mike always gives me a heads up when somebody has an interesting story. And uh, this guy is a music producer, film producer, all-around talented guy. I'm talking about Peter Foldy. How you doing, Peter? I'm doing great, Greg. How about yourself? I'm doing wonderful. Uh, you're in uh, L.A., I, I huh? I call you Greg, right? I don't have to call you Python or anything like that. You, whatever you want to call me. I'll call some, you Greg. <laughs> some people call me Py Python's was my D. I, I like African wildlife, you know, so I call myself the Python hyena. Then they're two of my favorite That's animals. Big it, man. That's awesome. Yeah. But uh, like you're in LA, right? Yes, sir. Can yes. You hear those sirens outside? Well, so so it's uh, it's uh, five o'clock where you are, it's nine o'clock here. It is. And I, I I like that. I like that. Mike Mike is always good with that. He gets me guests and he makes sure that because I got a day job. I work as a volunteer here, nice. and so uh, he works around that, and I really appreciate that. But uh, yeah, how how did you come to meet Mike Gormley? You know, um, I know a woman that he works with, a very good friend of his, Lisa Langlois, a Canadian actress, and I've known her for a number of years. I run into her at various Canadian events here in Los Angeles because I'm sort of in the Canadian circle of people here as well as the Australian circle of people because I used to live in Australia. And I used to run into Lisa and then she introduced me to Mike and then it turned out we actually knew each other many years earlier um, through a uh, an acting comedy improv workshop that we were both a part of in the, uh, I guess, mid-80s. So that's how I know Mike. We've been talking about doing some projects together, and we're trying to get a film made together. And that, that's basically that's the uh, Reader's Digest version of how I know Mike. You know, it's interesting, you know, because you asked me before we started the interview how I know Mike. I've never met Mike personally. Oh wow! I know Mike through Lisa. Oh, you know Lisa. So she's the conduit for both of us. Lisa, I haven't met personally either, but uh, Lisa, I had on uh, June, I think it was June 27th, 2015. She was my fifth oh, yeah. interview. And uh, I had her on because I absolutely love the movie Class of 1984. There you go. I've done three interviews from that movie alone. And uh, she was my first one I got from it, and I was so thrilled because I always loved Patsy, and um, I always liked her in it. And when I got an interview with her, like I got her through Facebook, and she uh, um, told me to arrange it through Mike, and she gave me his email address, and uh, and I arranged it, and uh, and uh, you know. Uh, through Lisa, like, you know, I, I come to know who Leslie Donaldson is, and I had her on back in, in April, and I, I like her a lot. And, uh, you know, and Lisa also, like, um, not only am I still in touch with her, she did something I thought was very special for me, because um, last year when they had that ice bucket challenge thing going, or a couple yeah. years ago, I remember that. Yeah. Well, after Robin Williams had passed away, they started something for suicide and depression called Doubt Fireface. Oh. And um, I I don't suffer from – I'm not suicidal, but I've had bouts of depression in my past, you know? Okay. And well, uh, – You know, it's, it's kind of common, I think. A lot of people do. Well, I remember I, I did this challenge. It involves taking a pie in the face for suicide prevention. 
And I remember there was this journalist in Los Angeles. I come from a Christian household, and this journalist belongs to an organization that's supposedly Christian, but I think they just use it for profit, and I will expose them when the time comes. But uh, she, uh, I asked her, because she followed me on Twitter, so I asked her, I said, well, if, if I nominate you to do this, because she, she I was nominating a lot of people she had interviewed, and I said, if I nominate you to do this, Will you do it? And she said, I'd have to nominate her first. So I did the okay. video. And then she turns around and says, great video, but I'm not taking a pie in the face. And I thought, a lot. yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. And then she goes and she interviews Angelina Jolie, who a group of uh, people nominated for that same thing. And uh, wow. I, yeah, I, I mean, they, and I, I hate it when people, like I said, I come from a Christian household. So I hate it when people use the Bible for profit. And um, these people have blocked me, but that's all right, because they've been forewarned that uh, I ba basically, you know, um, I look at it this way. You can block something, but like a snake, just don't step on me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. They know where I am. They know who I am. And I know full well they'll never come anywhere in the vicinity of me because I will embarrass them in front of whatever church they try to swindle out, out, of, out of cash. I mean, uh, I don't like this group, and I'm right now trying to get an interview with somebody who will expose them. And I'm going to read her tweet live on the air when that time comes. They're not going to they're going to have reason not to like me, but they can't sue me. If the tweet has been put out, and I can absolutely, yep, they can't. And hold on to the tweet so they, you know, it's it's, you know, there in your phone, and people can, you know, reach uh, for the phone and see that it's an actual tweet. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll made up. I'll I'll put it out there, like um, like I said, I'd like how dare them, you know? But these are the kind of people that are promoting junk like Fireproof as a great filmmaking, and it's just you know junk. But yet uh, they'll call down other movie critics, and I'm a movie critic since 1996. Oh, but wow. yep, so I, I some of the garbage they recommend, I, I'm appalled by. But uh, they seem to uh, they seem to try to tell filmmakers if they if they uh, uh, support them. They'll they'll need to make movies that make money, as if movies that make money are the best quality films. I just saw Everybody Wants Some nine times this year. It's a great film. Great, great film. film. You saw it? Oh yeah. I'm trying to get in, I'm trying to get an interview from that friggin' thing, and I can't, can't seem to contact no. any. You have to you know go reach out to the publicist on the picture, and maybe they can they can hook you up with somebody. I mean, the film has probably run its course now, so. And maybe not working on it and not promoting it, but it is a good film. It had a great look, some really good actors, and I really enjoyed it too. I loved it, and I've never seen a movie nine times in theater before. And uh, it just the, the, must really like it. Yeah, I saw, uh, like uh, and the nostalgia, the music was great. I even ordered the soundtrack because uh, I'm one of these people that still buys CD. I don't download it, you know, and I give them the benefit. So I saw that nine times. So I mean. And it didn't do real well at the box office because I think it was poorly released. You know, I don't think it was given the benefit for a decent release. Well, you know, unfortunately, people only go to see films now with stars in them, and that film didn't really have any big stars in it. I think the star of it was the was the genre and the and the setting, and uh, you know, the the flashback to to the past, and that was the element that I found really attractive. You know, it was a great story as well. But uh, people generally go to see films with lots of names, and or either that or superhero movies, comic book movies, and unfortunately films are not what they used to be. No, although it's interesting, Everybody Wants Some has got um, some uh, second generation actors in it, because Wyatt Russell is the product, so to speak, of Kurt and Goldie. <laughs> And, I did um, not know that. Yeah. Which guy is he? Let me. T I'm gonna look him up as we speak on the internet. He was a pot smoker who, uh, well, let's just say 30 years old. <laughs> okay. Everybody wants some. I'm looking as we speak. Everybody wants some. 2016. Yeah. He was. All he right. was the one that was smoking the bong. 
Hey, we all need a hobby, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Zoe um, Dursch is Leah Thompson's daughter. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And she's got Leah's that. eyes. Uh, I don't see her listed here, but I'm sure she's here. I'm just not fast enough on anything. I'm looking up Wyatt Russell right now. Played Willoughby. Yeah. Oh, he looks just like his dad. That's crazy. <laughs> God, does he ever look like his dad? It's amazing. He does. And he did a good job in that film. I think everybody was good. Oh, everybody was great. It was really great. Yeah. Like, I, I love the movie. So, if anybody tells me box office awaits uh, quality, I'm like, no. No. But you know what? Everybody wants some going to be a cult film eventually. It's That's where oh, it's yeah. going. Yeah. It's it destined. Will. I thought it was better than Dazed and Confused, and that was a good film. So It was. Yeah, but I like all those um, cult uh, cult style films and like that. But getting back to Doubtfire Face, so um, I remember I went and I did the thing again because I started doing these interviews, and uh, I nominated Lisa Langwas, and she accepted. She did it. She did it. Nice. And Mike filmed it. Oh wow! Yeah. So uh, I thought I was very gracious. Not only did uh, she do, do it, but as to show my gratitude, I, I made a couple of donations to one of her charities. Because, you know, she's... Well, there you go. Yeah. There's your team. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I really like Lisa. I've been a fan of hers for over 30 years. Oh, you're aging her. Don't tell her that. <laughs> Well, she's not. Oh, I guess she knows. She knows. She's not that much older than I am. You know how old I am? I don't, because I've never met you. I'll give you a hint. I was born the same year The Godfather came out. You were born in the seventies, and I'd say seventy-two. You were yep. Born. I'm good, man. I'm good. Don't mess with me. So you're born in seventy-two, so that makes you like forty-three-ish. I'm forty-four, actually. My birthday 44. was July eighth. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, awesome. Seventy two was just a kid, man. You're just a kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not that much younger than Lisa. Of course, I'm going to make her sound as young as I can, but she still she looks really good for her age. So, so there you go. She does. She does. She just finished a movie in Ottawa. I know. I'm supposed to have her back on here too. You know, um, I wanted to have her on for my birthday because when. Uh, uh, I had her on last year. She, she sang me "Happy Birthday," and I, and every time I watch Class of 1984, I, I say, "Patsy's been redeemed." Ah, <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get her back on here. Um, hopefully, maybe before the end of the month. You know, I if you're doing a, a film project, I'd love it if you put her in it. If she's right for the part, I definitely would. Actually, you know, you've got to check out uh, some of the interviews I've done because I've got some really talented people I've interviewed. That I will definitely do that. I've got a YouTube channel right now. I'm looking at your live journal as we speak. Oh, yeah? That's, you. That's your Python Paradise. I'm, I'm on there yeah. right now. Yeah, so I just, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to focus on what you're talking about and what I'm talking about, so I don't want to get too distracted. But I will check this all out when we what, what was, What's my live journal? Like on CHSR? Uh, yeah, live, it says Live Journal Python Paradise. That is you, right? Yeah. Okay. Has it got my interviews and stuff on it? I, it doesn't, as far as I can tell. It's, it's got people asking questions. Maybe it's a different guy. I, maybe it's about snakes. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, the, there's a CHSR page, but uh, not all the, the – because of the ser server, we're sharing a server – uh, not all the links are active. I'd okay. say about I got about nine of them that are active, so I put them on YouTube, and that's where I can keep them active. Got but it. but I'm putting them up uh, one a week. You're my 43rd interview. Oh my God! And that's since April of 2015 when I got a surprise interview through Rift Tracks with Tommy Wiseau of The Room. Nice. Now there's a guy you need to get in a movie. <laughs> I, yes, you'll have to send me some information about him. Oh, you don't know who he is? I don't. 
You've never heard of The Room? Oh, The Room. Yes, of course. That really bad movie that plays at midnight. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course. See, this is why I should not look at the internet because I don't want to get distracted. I want to be focused on your questions. Yeah, so since him, uh, I've been on fire. And like I said, I've got 15 of my 43 interviews up on my YouTube channel. All you have to do is type in Python's Paradise on YouTube and and uh, you, you can find uh, me. I got Lisa's interview up on there. And uh, I'm putting one up this Friday. So I put them up one a week. That way they can gradually gain interest. I think that makes sense. And sometimes if uh, somebody has passed away, sometimes I'm lucky enough to do tribute interviews because uh, oh. I've had Alfred Hitchcock's granddaughter on here. Nice. And that was incredible. And uh, That's very interesting. Yeah, and I've, I did a tribute to Ray Harry Husen, who was a great stop-motion animator and had somebody from uh, his foundation who worked with him come on the phone with me and celebrate the 35th anniversary of Clash of the Titans, which is a favorite of mine from my childhood. And uh, Zoe Tamerlis Lunn, who was in the movie Ms. 45, no longer with us, but her husband come on and talked to me twice, two, two, two interviews. Learned a lot about her. So I'll do stuff like that, you know. And, so are you mostly a person who talks about film or are you a person who talks about music? Both. Both, okay. I do mainly film, but okay. I'm, I'm open to do music, you know, because I know you've done both. And well, I started as a film student and then I fell into the music business and had a number one hit record in Canada in the 70s when you were one in 1973. <laughs> so I guess you didn't buy it. Thanks a lot, Greg. <laughs> I thought you would have gone out to pick up that record, but okay, I forgive you. But Well, uh, that was the no. year, 1973 was the year I was up-chucking, and that's okay because Linda Blair was up-chucking that year there too. <laughs> and then when you were two, I did a tour of the Maritimes, including Fredericton, Fredericton, New Brunswick. I think that might have been our first stop, or maybe not, I'm not sure. I was, you know, when, when we were talking earlier, I was trying to find the schedule for that tour. I have it somewhere, but I can't find it. But I know we played Fredericton. I've no, I think at a, at a hockey arena, arena is where we played. I know where you and would have played. It would have been the Aiken Center. That, that sounds right. The, yep. That is where we played. You know what? I have a photo. I'm going to email you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to send you this photo. Yeah, you, you just keep asking away or you keep talking. I'm going to find this photo. Yeah, the Aiken uh, Center is picture, still there. Uh, it's right here on campus. Taken with a radio by a radio station there, and I think, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll find it in a sec. Anyway, yeah, let's continue. Yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, you've been right in here in Fredericton. You're my second guest I've had that's been in Fredericton. A lot, a lot of people don't even know where we are. <laughs> well, I certainly do. Like I ask a lot of my guests if they if they know who the trailer part boys are because they're about the closest we have for celebrities here. Right, right, right. Some people do and some people don't. And well, I know I know exactly who they are. <laughs> now there's they, you gotta get them in a movie. Yeah, I'm giving you some ideas. <laughs> you do. You are absolutely. I will, I will write them all down. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, no, but I, I, I put down your background, and you're from uh, Budapest, Hungary. Now, are you from the Grand Budapest Hotel? Uh, I'm not, because that doesn't exist. That's <laughs> that movie. I okay, thought of that the not. moment I heard that. I was like, I was wondering if uh, he was the lobby boy. <laughs> I was, yeah, right, that would be me. I just found part of the tour dates for the Abraham. I, I toured with a uh, group called Abraham's Children, but it doesn't say Fredericton on it. This is it says Amherst uh, Stadium. Amherst, I have to enlarge this to see it. It's so, so damn small. But yeah, I can't see Fredericton, but I know we played there. 100% sure. Yeah. No, um, yeah, the Aiken Center is still here. It's been a while since I've been in there, but... Uh, but uh, if anybody tours through here, it's where they go. Usually we lose people to Moncton and St. John because they're bigger, right. you we know. We played Moncton. We played St. John. We played everywhere. Yeah. Like, I, I never leave Fredericton, like, you know. Like, I'm, uh, Lisa's lucky. She travels and whatnot. I, it's very hard for me to get away. And, uh, like, with my job, like, I'm the only one that uh, can do my day job, 
um, if if I don't get it done, then stuff gets behind. And so right. I know I've gone to a couple of concerts in Moncton and St. John. I saw Avril Lavigne in Moncton and St. John. Oh, yeah. And I saw Hilary Duff, who I had the pleasure of meeting backstage right. in St. John. And uh, and I remember when I saw Avril Lavigne in Moncton, like, uh, like that's uh, almost three hours away from here. Well, about two and a half hours. And and I had to get up for work the next day. I got home and back in Fredericton at about uh, two or three in the morning. And I and my alarm was going to go off at six. And I still made it to work. Wow. Yeah. Because it tells your boss something when you're out that late and you still show up, you know. It says you want that job. You don't want to be fired. <laughs> Well, I work in a family business, so I wasn't going to get fired, but oh, okay. uh, yeah, I work for my father, you know, my father's not well right now, but, uh, oh, sorry. yeah, but, uh, my father still keeps trucking. He's still, he's retired, but he, he, he works at the family business when he retired from his other job. He works up there and uh, he, uh, the hardest worker I know, but, uh, I didn't want him having to do his job and mine both, you know, because, yeah, so. Makes sense. Yeah, so I know some people that went to that concert and slap in the next day. Made, told them to have made that calling in sick call to work. Well, I did not do that, so I couldn't do that. But. Uh, Sweet. But, yeah, your background says, but of us, uh, but of us hungry, and then you went to Sydney Sydney, Correct. Australia. Now, I've done an interview from Sydney, Australia. Oh, who'd you talk to? It was the furthest I ever called out because it was like 1030 at night here. And it was like 1130 in the morning where this person was. Oh, yeah. I, I, I they're, inter they're a day ahead. so it's Yeah. I interviewed Little Nell Campbell, a.k.a. Columbia from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, okay. Oh, she was a delight. Yeah, I... Nice. Yeah, I like her, and uh, that was the furthest I've ever called out for an interview, and it didn't bother the station any at all. You know, I don't know what kind of package they have here, but uh, but um, they, they thought well, it was. Oh yeah, they may they may you know people don't pay for long distance calls anymore. That that was the old days when you know everything cost money. Okay, so CJCH was the radio station that we went to. Is, is that in your city, CJCH? Uh, I don't know what that is, but that's a radio station in somewhere in the Maritimes, CJCH. But I guess I don't know what city that's in. Well, we have. Well, I'm at CHSR. Right, CHSR yeah. Radio. Yeah, and uh, this station's been around since uh, 1960 or 61, so uh, we keep on trucking here. But uh, I like the fact, you know, like I can't stand Top 40 radio because you get these songs that play over and over and over and over. I remember when I started here, it was in 05. And I remember I was calling a radio station. I wanted to request my favorite Avril Lavigne song, which was a song that Chantal Kraviazic wrote called Together. I, okay. love that, I love that song, Together. And they wouldn't play it because it wasn't a Top 40 song. And I'm like... What's, why is this a request station if you're not taking my request? I'm not going to ask for something you're going to play anyway. So I remember the night I started here, I put that song on. It was like me flipping off those other stations, and I just cranked yeah. that song, you know? And uh, I played that, and I played a lot of uh, songs. Now, I don't mind, but we're, we're here at the station, we can play like 10% top 40, though every 10 songs, maybe one. But I, I like playing stuff that uh, you don't get to hear. That so do you also spin music? Um, like I, you personally play records, or is it the radio station that plays the records and you do the interviews? Uh, if I do a live, sh if, if I do a live show, I I just put, bring my CDs in. I play what oh, I. Okay, nice. Well, yeah. you should play. I have an album called Nine Lives, which uh, you know you should play some of the tracks from that. I could or do at that. Least, at least one track from that couple of tracks i could do that yeah um i played uh a lot of the interviews that i do like they're recorded so they'll play like on sunday nights when my show is on so uh I'm, i played the my tammy stranaka interview 
Uh, she was from the Empress of the Never Ending Story. The interview was like 35 minutes, so I had like 25 minutes to, to fill her in there. So uh, there was a couple of interviewees that had some music. Stefan Arngrim from Class of 1984 had sent me some music, so I played one of the songs he play, uh, issued, and I played a song by Daryl Purpose, whom I interviewed through Mike Gormley. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's very talented. Very talented, and had a great interview with him. And uh, I... Uh, I played some music of my own too. My interview when I interviewed Mike, I quizzed him on Canadian musicians, and um, he was very, very good. There are some people I couldn't believe he didn't know, like, but like I was surprised he didn't know who Lee Aaron was, and I was like, didn't everybody know who the Metal Queen was? Right. You don't know who she is either, do you? I don't. Great. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Okay, I was twelve when that album came out. So, but uh, but no, uh, but Sydney, yeah, I interviewed uh, Little Nell, but but I heard that uh, you hooked up with some boys that but later became the Bee Gees. Who, of yes, course, when when I was a kid in Australia, I my best friend was a singer. He was like when we were about thirteen or fourteen, and he was a singer on television, and he. Um, met some kids who were his age and they were the Bee Gees they were the Gibb brothers and he said oh you should meet these guys they're really cool they have really bad teeth and wear very funny clothes but they're very funny and uh, nice and very talented guys so I went around and met them and they were very interesting and you know the Beatles had just broken that was in the you know 64 63 64 65 so these guys had those kind of accents they were from Manchester originally and uh, they were very uh, precocious, very sort of grown-up 14-year-olds, uh, far more grown-up than I was. And they were playing in nightclubs at night, so they had a very different and interesting life. But you could tell immediately that they were super talented if you were in a room with them and they start playing and singing. You go, oh, my God, these guys are incredible. So when they broke, it was it was no surprise, but it was still a surprise. I was already in Canada when I heard their first single uh, a New York mining disaster, and I went, oh, my God, I can't believe it. And I felt very jealous in a way that I wasn't there to be a part of it. But by that point, they were in England and you know, hanging out with the Beatles and all this kind of stuff. So it uh, it was pretty amazing. But I have stayed in touch with them over the years. So Yeah, and well, I, you know I, what? what? Saturday Night Fever is one of my all-time favorite movies. That that is, totally, is a good one. That is a great movie, and it's had an influence on me too because uh, I gave myself a makeover after dealing with a lot of rejection because of how I dressed before, and how I dressed before was uh, kind of uh, Randy Savage inspired, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, I was not being well treated, you know. So I. Um, because I used to wear a bandana and stuff like that, and did I got you have long hair. Um, I did at one time, yep. But I got I'd, I'd have people walk up to me and ask for cigarettes or drugs. I got uh, c uh, accused of being a gangster, <laughs> even even Is though this in high school. This was uh, no more than about uh, five years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, it was just how how I, I used to watch a lot of wrestling. Now I think you know I, I don't care much for wrestling now, but but uh, I remember uh, the bandana and the shades, and I thought, ah, oh, Randy Savage is cool. So, but I would get that, and I didn't like it. And I sat. I remember sitting one night in Tim Hortons, which is. Uh, I know what Tim Hortons is. Tim Hortons? Good. <laughs> I, I know it well. Well, that's good because I, I, I'm, I'm, I keep forgetting you, you're... Uh, you've I been... lived in Toronto for many years. There you I go. Still keep my foot in the Canadian film and music scene, so... Okay. Well, I sat in at Tim Hortons with a friend of mine, and he was complaining about the kind of women that were coming on to him. He wasn't attracted to, and I looked at him because the lights were better here, because uh, in there, because we were at the nightclub, and he had cat hair all over his clothes, and I'm like, jeepers, oh. no wonder. <laughs> that would be a turn off, yeah, I'm sure. But um, one of my favorite movies, Saturday Night Fever, and that image of John Travolta coming down the street 
with the paint can, and he has the black leather jacket, the black pants, and the red shirt. And I remember I walked past a clothing store right after Christmas, and just randomly, I saw in the window the red shirt, and I knew what I had to do. And you had to I, buy one? I bought every color of shirt. I bought the red one. I got two black blazers and a silver blazer. And I'm going to tell you, it it boosted my self-confidence beyond what I expected it to. I've had people have said to me, they said, you know what? Um, you're a different person, but a different person in a good way. Because I was very self-critical and very negative. And so... Uh, I was bothered because I couldn't get a girlfriend. Now I still don't have a girlfriend, but I don't give a shit. <laughs> That's a different you say that I, word on radio. I can. You just did. Okay. Yep. Well, cool. I I just don't get too profane, but uh, yeah. But uh, Sh shit's okay. Shit's okay. <laughs> That's what Hollywood says when it re releases uh, some of these movies they release, like Pearl Harbor. Yeah, yeah that that was a shit movie. <laughs> It was, man. Yeah. But, yeah, but uh, there's been some other bad ones, so, you know, they're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Gili, uh, there. There you go. You said it. But, um, but no, uh, I just gave myself the makeover, and uh, I didn't expect it to do with me internally what it did, but it uh, boosted my confidence, and... Uh, and uh, when my friends started t telling me about it, that was when I first started to really catch on. But, uh, yeah, so Saturday Night Fever had a major impact on me that way. And uh, the Bee Gees, of course, uh, was a big part of that. That soundtrack was just terrific, you know. It was. And, you know, it wasn't written specifically for the film. The Bee Gees were working on this new disco type material for an album they were trying to do and Robert Stigwood their manager called them up and said look I've just produced this film called Saturday Night Fever they did all the all the dancing had already been shot to different songs so the Bee Gees took some of those beats and basically it found that the things that they were working on for their own album fit the movie perfectly so it was just kind of this uh, uh, serendipitous situation that made them incredibly wealthy I actually like their early stuff. I really like their stuff from the 60s. How, how do you mend a broken heart, which is actually 71. But, you know, words and it's love somebody and Massachusetts and all those things. They're really great. Yeah. No, um, they have the great sound, the voice, of course, a high pitch voice. Well, it, not in the beginning, but, you know, that's what they evolved into with the disco stuff. In the beginning, they didn't sing like that. That was kind of a, uh, that's the disco voices that they had later. Well, I, I play the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack on my show quite a bit, you know, and I don't play a lot of Top 40, but when I do, I do play uh, some Top 40 of that. It's, it's, it's got some great music to it that I've never been bored with. But you've done a... Nice. You've done a lot of music stuff here. I, got, I wrote some stuff down, like you were involved with, uh, um, forgive me if I get these names wrong, um, okay. Kanta Records? Kanata. Okay, Kanata. my apologies. It's a, Canadian, it's a Canadian word. It's I think there's a tribe of Indians, I believe, Kanata. Or there's definitely a place called Kanata, I think. Okay, but, and then there was... Yeah, that was an early label. That was the first label that signed me in the 70s, and we were very fortunate to... Uh, uh, put out the single Bondi Junction, which went to number one on the RPM Adult Contemporary charts, which was the only chart in Canada at the time. It was kind of like the Billboard of Canada. Uh, the people who ran it later invented the Juno Awards, uh, a guy called Walt Grealis and his partner Stan Cleese. And uh, they came up with the Juno Awards. They were great supporters of Canadian talent. Uh, this was at a time when radio really resisted playing Canadian content. And um, so I was very lucky. You know, it was a pretty big hit record. I mean, I was a uh, film student studying film at York University in Toronto when um, when the record came out. And it was, as you can imagine, I was just stunned and shocked and shocked and awed, really, just to hear myself on the radio every five minutes because that's what it was like. And 
the days of the uh, Top 40 radio in the 70s. They would just play it over and over and over again, and uh, it was incredible. And then you went to Capital, EMI, and Poly- Polydor. Yeah, th- then I got signed to uh, by Capital um, and did uh, some tr- couple had a couple of successful tracks for them. One of them was called Roxanne, not the Police version, but my version. Uh, and uh, not the Steve Martin well. version either, huh? I don't. Oh no, not the Steve <laughs> Martin movie version. No. <laughs> yeah. So then I bounced around some labels until I eventually found myself in Los Angeles and started writing scripts and sold a couple of scripts and ended up directing in the 90s and early 2000s and you know it's been sort of a fun ride yeah another I'm one still too writing. i'm still still in there yeah i still got my my hands and feet in, in the in the business so very grateful for that to be able to sustain an, a career in the entertainment business because many people can't yeah you also written down here free flight records you got you was part of that too huh yeah, Free Flight Records was a label um, that was owned by RCA. It was a pop label that uh, was started by the people who managed Dolly Parton, and uh, I signed with them. And uh, unfortunately, RCA shut the label down midstream, so I was in the middle of recording some tracks for them, and one day it was just over. And that's when I switched gears and went towards the uh, film film industry. I had already written a script, and... I was very lucky to meet somebody that helped me sell it. And, was that uh, called Hot Moves? It was called Hot Moves, yeah. It was a little teen coming of age. Between you and me, a pretty shitty little film, but uh, it was fun and funny at the time and um, had some naked girls in it, and so <laughs> it found some traction. And uh, the film was made for about $450,000, and it ended up making about $10 million. Uh, played theatrically in the States and some other places and was a big hit on VHS, which was just starting at the time. So, you know, people said, hey, I can take this tape home and look at naked girls in the privacy of my own, my own home. It wasn't all naked girls. It was four guys, you know, trying to meet naked girls. But um, it was a silly film. And, um, you know, it's a big success. I mean, I've got a gold, gold, the equivalent of a gold record for that thing, which is kind of cool. I, I, I didn't like, make any of that money. I got paid zip. I got paid virtually nothing to sell the script. But you know, I would have, I would have paid them to get a movie made in those days. You know, it's, it was an amazing opportunity. Yeah, I, I love the teen movies. You know, um, like uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, um, and uh, you know American Graffiti, and uh, you know stuff like that. I I love those kind of movies, especially the soundtrack albums. You know, yeah, uh, that really helps. Like I got I I ordered the Fast Times at Ridgemont High soundtrack as well. You know, and and uh, the music just just takes me back. And teen movies do it really well. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know what I watched the other night, which I loved, was Risky Business. I mean, oh, I what love Risky smart, Business. Smart movie. I love Risky Business. Oh, Fantastic. yeah, Tangerine yeah. Orange? Yeah, Tangerine Dream. Oh, Tangerine Green Dreams. Gee, yeah. I almost had it. it yeah. Was um, that was a great movie. Uh, yeah. I, you know what? I, I watched the making of, not the making of, but the story behind Risky Business, and nobody wanted it. Every studio turned that thing down. Nobody wanted it. And they said, well, go get a star, you know, and you know, how do you find a star that's 19 years old? Nobody's a star at 19 except, you know, a few people. Leo DiCaprio maybe, you know, 20, 30 years later. But um, there were no stars at the age of 19, you know. And he didn't, the director didn't want to get a 30-year-old to play 19. So he found Tom Cruise and Rebecca De Mornay, and he found David Geffen, who gave him the money to make the film. So yeah. he's a very lucky man, but he made a great product. The director of that film, I can't believe he didn't go on to make more movies because he had some interesting shots in that movie. Yes, he did. His name was Paul Brickman. Let's see Paul. what else he did. Brickman. I don't know if he did much more, but man, like some of the most interesting, uh, some interesting shots in that movie. I mean, that movie was uh, very well, very creatively well made. Yeah. Let's see. Paul Brickman, he did not do a lot. In, I mean, is he still alive? Yes, he's 67 years old. Um, he did Bad News Bears. Why would he do that? Oh, I see, that was before Risky Business. He did Men Don't Leave, which is kind of a cult film. Okay. Anyway, I should, there you go. I should see if I can find him and reach out to him, because Risky Business is going to celebrate sure. its 35th anniversary soon, and I'm... I'm 
I have some heavy doubts. Like, I know I've reached out to uh, Curtis Armstrong to come on here, but having her back and uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get Tom Cruise on here and probably not Rebecca Dornay either, but... I don't think Tom will do it. <laughs> and that's unfortunate. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be a coup if you got him? Yeah, well, I usually try to go after um, um, smaller stars anyway because they don't necessarily get to tell their stories. Like um, like having Lisa Lang was on here, I mean, it was like a dream. Like I was a huge fan and she's so normal, you know? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, she's so normal. Like if um, like getting um, A-listers, you know, you're dealing with all these publicists and managers and – and um, some of that red tape can be hard to get through, you know. So uh, absolutely. But sometimes you can get an interesting, um, like uh, like I had Christine DeBell on here from Meatballs, you know. I didn't have oh, to yeah. have yeah, I didn't have to have Bill Murray. I mean, Christine DeBell, she's gorgeous, you know. And, well, now listen to this. My first bass player in my band, a guy called Lenny Bloom, wrote Meatballs. Oh. So he left my band to write that film. He said, I'm uh, I'm going off to the... Me, wait, let me, I just want to make this right. Meatballs was the one about the kids in the summer camp, right? Yep. Yeah, that's one, yeah. He said, I'm going off to write this film for Ivan Reitman. It was Meatballs. And he's gone on to be a big screenwriter. Lenny Bloom. Yeah. So there you go. One degree of separation. Yeah. So, so it's like um, I've managed to get some interesting people on here. I didn't necessarily have to have A-listers to get in. I just want interesting. And uh, Mike Gormley has got me interesting. <laughs> nice. Well, that's what, um, you know, that's what makes radio fun when people have a chat and they're talking about things that people might be interested in. So, yeah. Now, of your films, I know you, your first one listed is Midnight Witness. Now, here's something interesting. I interviewed a guy. My fourth interview was just before Lisa, actually, was a guy named David Grove. He's an author. And uh, I've had a number of the Friday the 13th actors on here, and he wrote a book on the making of Friday the 13th. Plus, he did a book on Jamie Lee Curtis as a Scream Queen or Scream Queen years. But uh, he's, he's right now uh, getting a book published on actor Jean Michael Vincent. And he's Jean in. Michael Vincent, who I worked with in Midnight Witness. But it, before we go there, I just want to tell you that I'm very good friends with a guy called Paul Lynch, who directed Prom Night. So he's someone that you should definitely talk to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering, maybe you might be able to hook me up with some people. Paul, um, possibly. He leads a quiet life now here in Los Angeles, but he's directed. Look him up on IMDb. He's done tons and tons of television, hundreds of hours of television, and he's done some pretty good movies, Prom Night being his biggest film. But, you know, he's got some great stories to tell. So. Well, here's one thing, like... Uh, and this is one of the reasons, like you're about the sixth person I think Mike Gormley has sent to me. And the reason Mike sends people to me is because he knows I'm going to treat my guests well. Um, here, here's so one far, thing. I got no complaints, so you're doing good. Well, here's what I've noticed. This is what I'm up against, and this is why I can't get A-listers on here. This is the big reason, um, is because I've watched. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Quentin Tarantino both walk out on this one interviewer. He turned an interview with Quentin Tarantino into a, 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 a um, aggressive discussion about violence in movies. And Tarantino, in his words, shut him down. And then I watched Robert Downey Jr. get up and walk out of this on this guy because he turned an interview from Iron Man 3 to his past drug uh, oh, taking. Tacky. It's very Who tacky. Is this guy? I don't know, but I think he's a shithead. I think it was a hor right. horrible move on his part. I and uh, and then I watched another guy. <coughs> excuse me. Um, he's interviewing Bill Cosby, and he goes, "It does it does me no pleasure to ask this next question." I'm sitting here thinking, "This is the only reason you did the interview was to ask him that question because right. you're a sneaky little rat," you know. And uh, I think, you know, if I had somebody like, I love Lindsay Lohan. If I had yeah. Lindsay, if I had Lindsay Lohan on here, I'm afraid TMZ would make fun of me because I would never ask her a question about her time in court. I'd just spend an hour talking about mean girls. She might like that. Yeah. Like, but it's hard. 
I'm going to tell you somebody I reached out to was um, Victoria Jackson. And I wanted to talk to her about the movie UHF, which she did with Weird Al Yankovic. And there was this right. little co- – I didn't hear back, but I noticed on her website there was this thing that said um, – I forget exactly the words, but it had to do with uh, monitoring her emails because people have been making threats to her. Well, she was on the radio gay bashing and stuff like that, and uh, no wonder she's getting threats. But because of this, it prevents me from doing an interview. Who is it? Victoria. Her name again? Victoria Jackson. She's a comedian. She was in UHF. Oh, okay. I don't know her. Victoria Jackson. Let me look her up. As we talk here. Yeah, but, but I mean, all I wanted to talk about was UHF, and it's like, uh, because of this... Yes, it, UHF. Yes. Yeah, it hinders me. So uh, when you get people on there that uh, start in on the, um, the, the gossip, it becomes a, a barrier for s- some of us that just want to talk about their films and music, you know? Because I like to appeal to the midnight crowd. The midnight movie crowd's my favorite audience because they really get into the movies. They do. Yeah. But yeah, David Grove is doing a book as we speak on, on, on John Michael Vincent. And I had never heard of this actor until he brought him up. And I looked oh, him. you Of course you have. You've seen him everywhere. He was in um, Airwolf and he was in... Big Wednesday, and I mean, he's been working forever. He was a huge Disney star when he was young. He was like a really, really handsome kid, and uh, sadly became a drug addict, or, you know, I shouldn't say that. Uh, He sadly, how should I put this in a politically correct way? He took some paths in life that have not done, served him well, let's put it that way. But he's actually a very interesting guy, and I did direct him in my first film, and everybody said, be careful, Jan will bite your head off, he can be a real asshole. Can I say that? Sure. I guess I, I just did. And But he was very nice to me, and he and I hit it off pretty well after the film ended. I went around to his house in Malibu when he still had one and hung out with him and his wife, and, you know, he did like to drink, um, things like that, and I'm not much of a drinker, so I was a little afraid to be around him, because he's one of those guys that says, come on, man, come on, one more, one more drink, come on, dude, you know, and Jan, I can't, I won't be able to drive, come on, man, you know, one of those kind of guys, but, um, yeah. Yeah, I know who he is now, (laughs) he's one of those faces. Look at, look up his credits, He's, he's done so much work. Yeah, well, it's like it's like you said. I didn't know the name, but I knew the face. You know, right? Exactly. Yeah, but um, yeah, he's a midnight witness. Uh, uh, yes, and My first uh, film as a write as a writer, director, producer, and then you did Trust. Yeah. Trist. Trust. 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 I got that written down wrong. <coughs> it's pronounced Trist, and trist. it means you know a secret rendezvous. And you have Bar- Barbara Carre- Correa in that? Carrera. Carrera. Who was a Bond girl. Uh, Mark, yep. Mark, uh, Barbara Carrera was a Bond girl, and she was a very stunningly beautiful, and she you know, still is a lovely, beautiful lady. Um, interesting person and an interesting actress, and it was quite an experience. I, but um, Louise Fletcher, the uh, lady who won an Academy Award in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, was also in that. She, you know, she played Nurse Ratchet in One Flew Over the yep. Cuckoo's Nest. So she was in that movie and uh, a very talented actress. Another person you had in that movie uh, I know very well from The Omen is David Warner. Yeah, you do know David Warner. That's great. Most people don't know him. He is an incredible actor and just so talented and so professional. And um, we had some people on that set who were far from talented and far from professional. And David Warner just kind of, you know, he, he'd been there and he'd done it all. And he just kind of had a lot of patience because other people would say, hey, you know, get them to learn their lines or I'm leaving. But he was very, he was very good. So, you know, every movie is like going to war. Each one has its own dynamic, its own conflicts its own you know you fall in love with people you fall in hate with people people fight people have sex people do all kinds of crazy stuff so films are like a real microcosm of life and it's a real roller coaster and then when it's over it's kind of sad you kind of go oh you know it's like you know school's over for summer so yeah i was just gonna say that in order to increase uh, viewership what was uh, midnight witness about 
When was it out? Um, no, what what, what 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 was it about? Like uh, give oh, what was yeah, it about? give people it was list. Yeah, Midnight Witness was a film that I'll tell you the genesis of Midnight Witness. Uh, I was watching TV and I saw these people in a basement videotaping the police beating the crap out of some some Mexican ple- uh, people and I thought what if the cops knew they were being videotaped they would come after the peop- the person with the camera and beat the hell out of them. So I wrote a script about a guy who he's about to uh, it's his birthday and his girlfriend wants to get married and he doesn't and they're having a big fight they're going to break up because he doesn't want to marry her and he can't sleep and he's very depressed and he goes out on the balcony with his video camera and down below in the alley behind this building he sees the police beating the crap out of somebody and he videotapes it but in my movie in my story the cops see him and now it's a big chase they come after him and they chase him all the way to vegas so that was the basic story and then guess what happened a little incident called the rodney king incident happened which is a very similar story where a guy from across the road videotaped the police beating the crap out of um, rodney king and so my script you know, like art imitated life. So I wrote the script and I went to a company and I was very lucky to meet the president of the company who was a guy that would take chances on people, a guy called Menachem Golan. He, had, he produced a whole bunch of movies. And he said, what's your film about? And I said, it's kind of like the Rodney King thing. And he said, oh my God, Rodney King, we're going to make this. And he said, who's directing? I said, me. He goes, well, what have you directed? I said, nothing. It's my first film. And he goes, Okay. So the guy gave me my first movie, just took a chance, and thank God the film worked and worked well. It was made very low budget, 325000 back in the days when low budget was a million and a half. This thing was made for like, you know, a fraction of that, and it made, first year it made $3 million. So that was really sort of very fortuitous. And um, But, you know, it was not even about the money. It was a great experience, and... Um, Really enjoyed doing it, met some wonderful people. I got my feet wet as a director and uh, led to other things. What was uh, Trist uh, about? Trist was a thriller, and it was about um, Louise Fletcher, who's a housekeeper to this beautiful couple, to uh, Barbara Carrera and David Warner, who are very wealthy. And her son shows up, who's this really handsome kid, and the... uh, the lady of the house, Barbara Carrera, seduces the boy and gets her to kill her husband, David Warner. And that's that's basically what it's about. Okay. Well, after that, you do a movie called Widow's Kiss, which stars somebody I really, really like, Beverly D'Angelo. I love this woman. Yeah, Beverly's a trip. Um, Beverly, when I was making records, she was one of my background singers, and then she went off and became a movie star. So... It was kind of weird to be working with her as a director as opposed to a singer because that's how I knew her as a singer, and I was a singer too. And um, yeah, she was uh, she was sort of having her last hurrah as a really attractive, sexy woman. She had no problems taking her clothes off in this movie for the love scene. You know, she's you know she liked being naked. She just uh, you know had no problems <laughs> whipping her shirt off. What can I tell you? So, um, but a very talented actress, and um, I, you know, I enjoyed working with her. She was fun. You know, it's funny because uh, I listened to Howard Stern a lot, and he talked. Uh, he was cri- very critical of Game of Thrones. He said, um, "Who has it? Um, oh, uh, there was an actress, and I'm trying. I think Amelia Clark. I think it was." Um, uh, used to take her be naked in Game of Thrones. Now I don't watch Game of Thrones, so I have no reference here. But I guess she used to do nude scenes, and then uh, once she became a movie star and starred in, term- in that latest Terminator film, she stopped taking her clothes off on Game of Thrones. And he was pissed off. Yeah, he didn't like that. And I love listening to Howard rant. Yeah, he's great, isn't he? I think Howard's the best. And a lot of people, he's very misunderstood as well because he's got talent even outside the radio. He does photography, he does painting, and he does this uh, wonderful charity for North Shore Animal League, which he does with his gorgeous wife, Beth, who is actually seven days younger than I am, which is interesting. Yeah, except she's better looking than I am. But Well, you know, Howard just asks really, you know, not tough, but really personal questions i mean he just he doesn't hold back i mean i've heard him interview people and it's like you know his questions like oh my god i can't believe he has that i can't do that i think uh, and i'm not being critical of him 
is just, um, number one, I, I get him. But at the same token, I find that with me, I find that my audience wants to hear about the films and the music. So I, right. I'm very, very brief in terms of background on people. But as far as relationships go, I don't think it's any of my business to talk about a person's sex life or who they're involved with. Yeah, I don't think that should be a subject. Like, like who cares, you know, in a way? I mean, yeah, I think certain things should be private, and I don't think people have, you know, need to know everything about a person. Why would they? It's about the work, especially if you're you know, a writer, director, celebrity type person, like, why Why do you need to discuss that? Like, you don't go up to people in the street and say, you know, tell us about your sex life. You know, why would you ask that of a celebrity? Well, I got a story for you. I interviewed Todd Duffy on here not too long ago, and he was in the oh, movie, yeah. he was in the movie Office Space. He played uh, Brian, the guy with 37 pieces of flair that worked with Jennifer Aniston. Um, when I got contact with him, he had mentioned to me that he'd had some harrowing, harrowing experiences with interviewers. And he asked me if I interviewed anybody he knew. And unfortunately, I hadn't, but I, I, I sent him a list of the people I have interviewed. And he liked the list, and he got right back to me, and he said, um, you checked out fine. And uh, we arranged a time, and I did an interview with him, had him on for uh, almost two hours, actually, and... Uh, I, after we were done, I, I saw a post he put on Facebook that I was very touched by. He said um, he's put 1.6 uh, hours talking to somebody from um, on the phone. He said he never thought he'd talk to anybody that long on the phone, let alone from New Brunswick, Canada. <laughs> he's, wow. He said Canucks must are really easy people to talk to. And he said, go Canucks. And I was like, well, I appreciated that, and plus, I might have opened up the chance for other people maybe to interview him because, uh, like I said, it's like with those other journalists, you know, um, he's been attacked, but I, I was happy to be able to give him that experience, and in return, he gave me a great interview, you know? Well, that's great. Yeah. So I try to come off, and I know Mike Gormley knows that well because he sends me a lot of people. Um, I try to treat my guests really well. My birthday was July 8th, and I must have had uh, seven or eight of my interviewees wish me happy birthday on Facebook. Well, happy birthday, man. Yeah. I, I, did, I didn't know you, though, so. Well, you know why they wish me happy birthday? Because I treated them well. That They were on my friends list, but I treated them well. So well, that's why would you? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Why would you treat anybody other than well? Well, I, I want to try to uh, expose people to uh, New Brunswick as well as the station here, you know, and and uh, give that nice little connection. But but getting back to Beverly D'Angelo, you know, like um, I know her well as Ellen Griswold. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh man, like I still get turned on when she does the song in European Vacation where Chevy Chase is filming her and she's going like blah 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 so you know oh yeah you remember that scene uh I don't particularly oh. remember it but oh and she's rolling down around the floor there and she like she does that song and uh, Chevy Chase is filming it on a video camera and some of the looks she gets in her eyes, like, I'm like, she knows how to turn men on. <laughs> well, she's a very sexy woman. She definitely is. And she still looks good today, too. She does. She does. Did you uh, did you see her in Entourage when she was on that show, the TV show? Did you ever watch that? You know what? I, I don't watch television, but i got to admit, I'm one of the few critics that love the Entourage movie. I didn't love the Entourage movie because, I th first of all, I thought the TV show was a lot better than the movie, but the movie was fine. It was an hour and a half of fun, so I, I, I have no problems with it. Well, I got to admit, I thought um, uh, the Dylan fella, um, not Matt Dylan, was it Kevin Dylan? Yes. Kevin Dylan. I thought he was hilarious in it, and it was really cool to see Haley Joel Osment. After all these years, you didn't see him. It was kind of cool seeing him uh, outside the child roles and playing this yep. total douchebag. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. He didn't. He didn't grow into a handsome man, did he? 
No, but you know what, though? I like the he fact... Charming. He was charming. He, yeah, I like the fact that he was able to be different. I wasn't seeing this little kid from The Sixth Sense, you know? I like, Correct. Yeah, so I like that. But, um, of course, you had the, the lovely woman from the Blurred Lines video in it and whatnot and all that. But, uh, but I, I like the movie, but... Uh, no, uh, Beverly D'Angelo, I don't think, was in the movie, which is unfortunate because why she would have added to it. She was not in Entourage, the last Entourage movie, and I don't think there'll be a third one, but uh, we'll there, see. There wasn't Ooh, it. Was this the first one? This was the I, first one. This is the first one, okay, so, yeah. But uh, Sorry, my well, bad. Yeah, I love Beverly D'Angelo. I, look, I looked her up, couldn't find anything uh, on her, so... I, I usually, when it comes to uh, anniversaries for films, I try I see if I can seek interviews from people. But um, some people you can find web pages and whatnot, and are even on Facebook to contact people. And some people uh, you can only go so far with. So, but uh, I always thought Beverly was uh, was awesome. Of course, you mentioned singing. Like, what what was it, Harris she was in? She was in the uh, movie Hair. I guess that would have been in the, I don't know. 70s. I'd say late 70s, yeah. I, you know, I think they made that movie too soon after the Broadway show closed. I think they should have waited. And I don't, I, I really, a lot of people love the movie, but I love the play Hair. That was like a really great play. So I'm more about the play than that movie. Just saying. It's been a while since I've seen it. It's been a while since I've seen that movie, but... Uh... No, I love Beverly D'Angelo. I, I think she, hands down, now this is my opinion, while the standout people I've noticed that you worked with was Beverly. Yeah, well, you know, I also worked with Joe Pantoliano, who was in Risky Business. He played Guido the Killer Pimp. <laughs> yeah. He played the pimp in uh, yep. Risky Business. So I was very excited to work with him. He's done a lot of things. He's a real character and a very good actor, so... Yeah, um, enjoyed that. And then after that, you did um, Seeds of Doubt, where you worked with Peter Coyote. Yes, Peter Coyote, a guy called Joe Lando, who was the long-haired dude from uh, Doctor Quinn, Medicine Woman. Okay. And the Canadian actress called Alberta Watson, who was sadly passed away. Oh, yeah. Peter Coyote was an ET, and uh, I met. I, I was lucky enough to have Dee Wallace on here last uh, November. Oh, nice. Oh, D. Well, D. did a film down here in New Brunswick called um, uh, "Killing Roof: The Snuff Diaries." Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, she's she's been down this way. So it was interesting uh, having her on for an interview, and uh, she talked about uh, E.T. and of course Peter Coyote. Uh, that name resonates from that film. So what seeds of doubt about? Uh, I didn't write Seeds of Doubt. Seeds of Doubt is about a um, a woman journalist who basically believes that a serial killer who has been put into jail is innocent. She uh, goes on a campaign to get him out and ends up falling in love with him. And of course, uh, you know, there's more to the story, you know. But I won't, I won't reveal if he's the killer or not. But uh, it's a thriller and it's pretty good. It was shot in Toronto. Uh, in the 90s and had a lot of fun doing it. Okay. And then, of course, uh, you did a, a movie called Silver Man where you get to work with Eugene Levy. <laughs> yes, the great Eugene Levy. Silver Man was also shot in Toronto. And uh, it's a very interesting story. Another one I didn't write, but it's about a street performer, a very worldly street performer uh, called Silver Man, two words, not Silverman. That's my tailor. Uh, this is <laughs> Silver Man, and uh, he's uh, traveled the world, and he's got silver skin, and it isn't painted on. It's for real. He's kind of like the guy Powder, in a sense. Remember that movie? Yeah, so I Silver didn't Man care for Powder. <laughs> um, it was interesting, but there is a real condition like this where people have this. It kind of comes from mercury poisoning. Okay. And there are people like that with kind of discolored skin, and so Silver Man has the skin, and falls in love with his beautiful next-door neighbor who has a crazy boyfriend and all kinds of stuff happens. And uh, Eugene Levy plays a gangster. And Joe Pantoliano plays... Um, uh, he plays an accountant who's also tied into the mob. And uh, it's, it was a fun movie to make. We had uh, 18 days to make it, but we lost about a 
day and a half to rain. So now we were down to 16 and a half days to make this film. And a lot of, um, a lot of uh, challenge, you know, it was a challenging movie to try and uh, get the, get all the shots and get all the performances, but we did it. So What's interesting is that this, this came out the year after Eugene Levy played Jim's dad in American Pie. Correct. Oh man, I, I I thought he was. And he told me about that, by the way. He was offered two teen films, and one was very raunchy, called American Pie, and the other one was less raunchy. And Gene Levy is a very sort of. He's really in. Imper- people say, "Oh, is he hilarious? Is he funny?" And you know, he's not in person. He's like, "Oh, hello, Peter. It's Eugene Levy. How are you doing? Nice to meet." You. He's very kind of straight laced. He's got a kid of his own. You know, he's a family man. And he chose the film that was less raunchy. And his manager said, you know what? And both the films seem to have like a very similar subject line. I don't think there was a pie in both of them. But um, <laughs> he, uh, he chose not American Pie, but for some reason the other one got put on hold. And his manager said, let's take American Pie. And he did. And he's made an illustrious career. He's become world famous as a result of that film, and he's been in about seven or eight of them, and I'm sure getting a ton of money. To, well, what uh, to a different H1. role for him, though. I mean, the father that approves of the son. Like, I like it when, like, poor Jason Biggs, he's going to be famous. Like, like in Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back, they make reference to this, like, I'm always going to be known as the guy that screwed the pie, you know? And uh, yeah. Eugene Le- Levy walks into, and I love it when they're sitting there and they get the mangled pie on the table and Eugene Levy's like, you'll just tell your mother that we ate it all. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, yeah, scene, well. that scene where they're looking at the picture on the wall and goes, that was the day. Remember that trip? i just like to take a moment to talk about masturbation. <laughs> uh, funny. I mean, I've only seen the first one, really. The rest of them uh, are not, not good. Yeah, the, the rest of them are not, you know, not great. Yeah, I like the first one. wasn't a big fan of the second and third and whatever, you know. But I like the that. last one was pretty bad. I don't know. Yeah, but listen, they keep making money. It's a great franchise. I mean, can you imagine? You know, but yet to print money. But yeah, everybody wants some, which I think was a great movie. Because a poor marketing doesn't do as well, and you you'd think yeah that, of course I think that will reap it in the end though when it gets on, you know on cable and Netflix and whatnot. But I find a lot of people they go to what they're told to see, and yeah. I yeah I don't fly that way. Like we just had the Jason Bourne movie come out, but I'm more interested in Nerve because I haven't seen any advertisements for it. So I went on and looked up the trailer. I'm like, okay, this looks interesting. Whether it'll be interesting is another story. Well, I saw the new Jason Bourne movie. You know what? It's all action. Um, between you and me, if I can give my review on it, sure. the story is ridiculous. It makes no sense. I mean, it makes sense, but it's like a who cares story. You know, uh, They're trying to get Jason Bourne to come in to come in and he's got some issues and whatever it's the same old stuff over and over but the action is phenomenal there's a car chase at the end in vegas that was really incredible so and can yeah. you hear those sirens out there yeah i think there's a car chase uh no there's no car chase today. <laughs> it's just like the ambulance going by or the fire truck well there you uh, go but yeah interrupting our radio interview that's not polite but your listeners in new brunswick can listen to la sirens well, you know what? When I interviewed Tammy Sternock, you could hear an ambulance in the background. She was in New York. Oh, nice. oh yeah. I don't mind that either because it brings a, a level of reality. <coughs> yeah. Yes, it's real. But, uh, but yeah, uh, Silverman you did with Eugene Levy. And um, yeah, it's interesting, Eugene Levy, she, she, he was one of the people that Lisa Lang was nominated when she did the Doubtfire phase, too. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And uh, she nominated a lot of the can- Canadian uh, uh, comedians out there uh, to uh, take part in that. Now, I I don't think they've done it or even seen it. Like getting that to them is another. I tried Twitter and whatnot and right. all that, but uh, no, I, I appreciate her doing that. But I remember uh, Eugene Levy was one of the people that she threw that out to, but. Uh, but yeah, you worked with some other interesting uh, personalities too, like uh, 
Paul Rudd. Now I did. I did. I directed Paul Rudd in his first two films. Like before he had ever starred in a movie, I did a couple of short films and we hired Paul for it. And he was an amazingly interesting, funny, and very talented guy. And you could tell right away this guy's going to be a star. Yeah, I remember when I saw him in Halloween 6, A Curse of Michael Myers, which was nowhere near as good as Carpenter's classic Halloween. But, Correct. Yep. Yeah, but I remember he was in that, and he was in Clueless, and then uh, he kind of uh, went into the background. But to me, I loved him in The 40-Year-Old Virgin, and I loved him well, in thought, Anchorman. And... I thought he was great in The 40-Year-Old Virgin. I loved him in This Is 40, one of his recent films. Yeah. And he's got he's a huge movie star. He's Ant-Man. He's, he's Ant-Man. hundreds of millions of dollars now. And I discovered him. I put him in my first movie. You disco- How did you discover well, him? I, Just I a- didn't discover him. I mean, he was already, you know, he was well discovered by agents and managers by that point. You know, he just came and auditioned. I mean, he auditioned for my short film. He was looking for work. And you had no idea at the time that he was going to issue something called the Sex Panther that works uh, 60% of the time, uh, most of the time, or whatever that was. <laughs> Uh, what's the Sex Panther? I'm... Did you see Anchorman? Oh, I, you know what? I wasn't a fan of Anchorman. I really oh, wasn't. Really? Seriously? Yeah. Love Anchorman. I just did somehow just, I don't know, man. I just didn't work for me. I just didn't quite work for me. Oh, I liked both of them. I thought You, you know was... what's funny this week, by the way? I don't know when you're going to air this, but, um... Bad Moms is really fun. It's really fun. You should take a look at that. You know what? I'm actually <laughs> considered between that and Nerve. Um, yeah, what is Nerve? Let me take a look. Nerve's got Emma Roberts in it, which is a plus for me because she's cute. But uh, it's got Dave Franco in it as well. Oh, yes. But that looks like it might be interesting, you know? Let me take a look at Nerve. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what what it's about, but I'm going to tell you in a minute because I'm looking it up. But, yeah, I mean, I I go to a lot of films. I'm a member of, um, BAFTA, the British Academy here. And so we get a lot of screenings. And, okay. Uh, you know, I get to see a lot of films, which, uh, you know, is very fortunate. And uh, I like seeing loads of films, and I like seeing them early. Emma Roberts, Dave Franco, right? Yeah. Right now. Machine Gun Kelly. So tell you know me. I saw it at oh, yeah? the supermarket the other day. Who? Ed Burns. See if you know who that is. Oh, I know that name. I'm trying to think. What did I see him in? Uh, um, he was on a TV show a long time ago in the 60s. It was called 77 Sunset Strip. He was on a TV show called 77 Sunset Strip, and he played Cookie Burns. Okay. I think that was his name. Maybe it wasn't Burns. Cookie Cookie somebody. But, uh, yeah, he was a big, huge icon of the 60s. And I saw him at the supermarket. He's in his 80s now. Oh, Okay. I'm thinking about Edward Burns, and I had the wrong... No, that's Edward Burns, yeah. Different guy. Who was the funniest in Bad Moms? Um, oh, who was the funniest in Bad Moms? There's a lady... Um, let's see, I'll tell you her name. Um, Bad Moms. That's, you're asking me a tough question. Let's see how quickly I can get to it, because I'm blanking on the names of the stars. Bad Moms. My computer's fast right now. Um, the funniest was um well christina applegate was really good i think she i think she's got the most gorgeous eyes in hollywood she is gorgeous she's a stunning stunning woman she's beautiful but her eyes really stand out and she's so sweet and vulnerable you know you just want to give her a hug uh, yeah. Catherine Hahn is pretty funny. Ka- Catherine Hahn, she was in Bad Words. There's another movie nobody went to, and I went to it twice. Really? Well, definitely go see uh, Bad Moms because I think you'll like it. Let me look at Bad Words. Is it Bad Word or Bad? Yeah, Bad Words. Jason Bateman starred in it and he directed it. Oh, that one. Yeah, uh, I about that film. I loved it. I like Jason Bateman. Yeah, he's kind of, like I find it interesting when like, when you get actors in movies that look like people you'd see around you. Yeah, he seems like a totally down to earth guy. Yeah, but I thought Bad Words was terrific, and uh, I think people just didn't get it. But I went to it twice when it played here. What was it about? Basically, it's about a spelling bee. Right. And uh, he enters it. Because uh, because some kind of loophole, 
he was able to enter it. And it's a very crass, <laughs> kind of in a bad Santa meets Little Miss Sunshine way. Nice. And uh, everybody hates his guts because uh, he's ruining the spelling bee. But there's a reason he's ruining the spelling bee. And I'm not going to tell you why because it's a, okay. a, a twist. Okay, check it out. Yeah, but Catherine Hans are uh, writing a, a thing on him, and uh, and she accompanies him, and uh, and she's very funny in it as well. But Jason Bateman directs this movie, and I was pretty impressed with uh, what he came up with. But I thought the movie was terrific, and uh, he's a talented guy. Yeah. So we're up to an hour and twenty minutes at the moment. <laughs> Well, I got two more people I do want to ask you about before you go. Okay. And I also want you to, I'd love it if you'd mention my new album. It's called Nine Lives. And for anybody who remembers Bondi Junction, I think they're going to remember, I think you're going to like not my CD, Nine Lives. It's got some good tracks on it. And maybe you could play a couple of songs at your convenience or, or not. Or I think so, sure. To your listeners if you want. What kind of music is that? Copies. Pop music. Okay. I'll send you some MP3s so you can listen to it. But if you want, I can also mail you some albums. You can give some away to your listeners if you want. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, we could do Whatever that. Like. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I was going to ask so you. Who do you want to ask me about? Porsche Doubleday. Uh, I don't know Porsche Double Bay. I came onto that movie um, in, in the. Uh, it was already finished shooting. I actually met her very briefly uh, one of the last days they were shooting. But I came on as a co-producer, really as a music supervisor. But I did a lot of work for them, and they also gave me a co-producer's credit. And it's a film called uh, Almost Kings. A nice little movie. Nice little movie. I liked her in Youth and Revolt. Movie. I liked her in Youth Sorry. and Revolt with Michael Sarah. Right, she did that, yeah. Yeah. Another person you have down here, a fellow Canadian, beautiful woman, Natasha Hinstridge. Again, my friend Paul Lynch, who directed Prom Night, did a movie called The Christmas Switch that she was in. I met her briefly. I helped out with the, doing some ADR for her or helping her record some ADR. But I was also the music supervisor on that film, and I have the closing song, a Christmas song called All I Want for Christmas is You, which uh, thankfully that Christmas movie gets a lot of airplay and I make some money having some songs in it. But yeah, it's a great little Christmas movie called The Christmas Switch. I recommend it. Okay. You got anything coming out uh, now besides uh, Nine uh, I'm Lives? I'm working on some new film projects. You know, it's gotten much harder to get films financed. Uh, but, you know, I've got a couple of really good projects in the pipeline and hoping that uh, serendipity and good luck will come my way again, as it has in the past, and I'll get some more films out there. And You know, I've got this album, Nine Lives, um, which is available on iTunes and all the rest of the outlets, and uh, getting some airplay on some of those tracks, and about to record some new music again soon, and uh, just enjoying, you know, being blessed enough to make a living for 40 years in the entertainment business without having to wait tables or do a day job, you know, just to be able to make make a living and, uh, you know, travel the world and meet really interesting people. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for that. Well, listen, uh, how would uh, I be able to, like, how would you be able to uh, send me anything like that? Because uh, well, I, I can mail you a couple of albums or a few albums if you want me to. I can just, you, you can, when we finish interview i can you know take your address down and i can also email you some um when you give me your email I email you some mp3s okay we can do that <clears throat> okay or i could send you some higher res that you'd have to, i could i could zip them up in a zip file and then you'd have to download them uh that that might work i know i've had some bad luck trying to do that but um well, I'll tell you what else you could do. You, well, I won't say this on the air, but there's a secret link on my website where you can find the tracks and download them. So we'll, we'll, we'll try that. Okay. We'll try that first. You, you, you know, we'll exchange information so that we can, we can do all this stuff. Okay. And I'll mail you, I can mail you some CDs and you can you know, take calls and say I'm giving away Peter Foldy's new album. Okay, yeah. And get can. your program director on that station to see if they want to play any of it. Yeah, we uh, we'll have to do that. Uh, I know Daryl Purpose was played on here by somebody before I interviewed him, so so nice. that was pretty interesting. But yeah, I would gladly play your music. Although I haven't done a live show on here in months because I've been recording okay. these 
I've been recording well, you these. You know what I'll do is when I send you, I'll send you, I'll mail you some albums, and then you keep a couple for yourself and give one to the music director or the program director and say, Peter Foldy had a number one Canadian hit. He's a Juno-nominated recording artist, and you should check this album out. Well, they would definitely play it. Yep, we we would uh, definitely be down down with that. Well, that would be amazing, Greg. You'd be doing me a big service. Well, I I would gladly do that. I would gladly. And I do will that. find some interviews for your show. You know, I, I you should talk to Paul Lynch, but you know, I can't get you Paul Rudd, unfortunately. But I can try and get you Paul Lynch. Could you get me Beverly D'Angelo? People, I don't have any contact with Beverly anymore. You know, I I you know we've kind of lost touch. You know what happens when people go off onto a different stratosphere? They stop talking to the people that they knew in their past life, just like Rudd and Beverly D'Angelo. And, you know, they're, they're living in their multi-million dollar mansions and hanging out with, you know, superstars. And I'm living in a far lesser uh, environment, but hanging out with wonderful friends and wonderful people and wonderful family. So, again, I'm very fortunate. Well, you know what? If you give me some interviews for my show, that would be very well appreciated, you know? Um, I'll do my best, man. Because, uh, you know, I've treated you pretty well. I think you know that. And, um, yes, I try- you didn't trash me. I appreciate I, it. I didn't trash. Well, that's one thing I'm trying to get out there to some of these people, you know, is, you know, to come on my show. And some people I almost feel are reluctant. Maybe it's because of bad experiences, but... I try to celebrate their um, their music or their movies. Yeah, look, I'm I'm always happy to chat. You know, I've got something to promote right now, Nine Lives, and uh, you know, I'm always happy to chat. And it's like even if like four people, you know, sort of say, "Oh, I want to check out Peter Foldy's music." That's four people that didn't know it before. So I'm I'm grateful. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to ask a couple of quick questions. Now, I'm going to be putting your – now, your interview will eventually – I think it's going to play sometime in September because I've got okay. interviews recorded, no backed up that, that, that far. But um, I will I'll, – I'll have the link sent to you when it okay. uh, podcasts out. But eventually, because it's only going to stay on the server here for uh, maybe about three months, and then uh, eventually it's going to end up on my YouTube channel probably next year sometime now because I put one interview on my YouTube channel a week. Now, when I put the interviews on the YouTube channel, I like to have uh, photos go along with... Yeah, I'll be happy to send you some photos. Okay. And by the way, you, you're going to edit this down, right? You're going to take the interesting parts and all of that, right? Or do you just play it as is? I just play it as is. Oh, okay. I'm not that skilled with uh, editing. Uh, there's people here that are, but unless some, unless somebody tells me that there's something in it that uh, they wish they hadn't said or something like that, then right. then I could have something edited out. I've done that. But uh, I know when I had Adrian Barbeau on here, like um, she had mentioned her address for when we asked for an autograph. And I had to go back. I had to edit her address out, you know. Right. <laughs> and I did that, you know, and you can't even tell where it is. But um, but anyway, yeah. That, so it'll probably be about next February it goes on the next the YouTube channel. But it'll be on the CHSR site before that. Uh- I'll definitely send you some photos. Yeah, because so, that, that would when work. When we get off the air, are we still on the air? We're still on the air. Still on the air. When we get off the air, we'll exchange information so you don't have to edit anything out. You'll give me your email. I'll give you my email. You'll give me your mailing address. I'll send you some CDs, and uh, we'll be rolling, Greg. Yeah. And uh, one more thing. Um, okay. Could you do a plug for my show? Where? Oh, like right now? Yeah. Okay, so you want me to say, hey, you're listening to Greg Gilbert on CHSR Radio, Fredericton, New Brunswick. Well, I can't say New Brunswick. Let me do that again. Hey, you're listening to Greg Gilbert on CHSR Radio. There you go. That oh, works. Wait, I'm going to do another one. Let me do another one. Okay. Hey, this is Peter Foldy, and you are listening to Greg Gilbert on CHSR Radio. There you go. In Frederick. That yep, that works perfectly. Yes, and you know what? You got to uh, you check out my YouTube page because there's some people you can cast in your movies. Like Lisa Lang was. I never get tired of seeing her. You love her. You're crazy about Lisa. I like Lisa, especially <laughs> when she had the red, the the pink hair in Class of Night. Did you ever see Class of 1984? Uh, 
1984. I don't think. Is it a Canadian film? Oh, yeah. I did not see it. Oh, Roddy McDowell. I, I see a lot of films. I missed that one. Uh, it came out in 1982. It's about school violence, and she's part of this gang. And uh, she had, like, reddish-pink hair in it. She's like a punker. She's one of the nasties. Oh, dear. Yeah. 1984. Is it the numbers 1984? Yeah, it's called Class of 1984, but the movie oh, came out in... Class of 94. Perry King. Perry King, Timothy Van Pat. Roddy McDowell is amazing at... Right. Yeah, he's got a scene... Directed by Mark Lester. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, that is a really, really good film. I recommend you check it out. But uh, Timothy Van Patten, Roddy McDowell, Michael J. Fox. Yeah, it was his first film. No way. Yeah. Lisa I'll have to ask Lisa about that. Al Waxman, who passed away. Interesting. Yeah, I've done three interviews from that film. I interviewed Lisa, I interviewed Stefan Arngrim, and I've interviewed Mary Lynn Ross. Nice. Yeah. So I've had uh, lots of contacts with that film. And, uh, that was where I discovered Lisa, and I've been a fan of hers ever since. I was quite smitten with her in that because, you know, uh, uh, Patsy was an interesting sort, and, of course, Teenage Head does music, and I play their, their music here on the show, too. So, uh, yeah, that was where I discovered Lisa, and uh, like I said, she did the Doubtfire Challenge. When you go on my YouTube page, you'll have to check out her Doubtfire Challenge. I'll check it out for sure. Yeah. So, uh yeah, you, you, any, you, any of these people that I've interviewed, you know, they're all good people. I've got no complaints about them. They've got no complaints about me. I'm pretty sure you would have a great working experience with any one of them. Nice. So, so those are some casting choices for you. Check it out. Yeah. So I'm just going to close out this interview, and I want you to stay on the line so we can exchange information. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So, folks, that was Peter Foldy. Check out Nine Lives, which uh, we're going to be checking out here as well. When I get that CD and, and here at the station and I get one of those live studio moments, I'm going to play some of that music and so that uh, we can hear something different for a change instead of all that constant parade, parade of Top 40, which can get boring after you hear it four or five times a day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I remember I heard, uh, I think Kid Rock's All Summer Long is a fine song, but I heard it four times one day at work, and it was to the point where it's like, isn't there anything else on that CD? Uh, just, want, yeah. just wanted to tear my hair out. But uh, nonetheless, this has uh, been a great show. I want to thank Peter Foldy for uh, being generous enough to give me his time tonight to come on here and talk about his films, his music. It's time with the Bee Gees and Nine Lives, among other things. And uh, I want to thank Mike Gormley for setting me up with another interesting uh, guest. Well, thank you, Greg. I appreciate you saying that. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you. It's been a lot of fun. So, folks, this is Python signing out here in Fredericton.